Let me introduce the moderator for this exciting webinar, Professor KCR Raja, who is an amazing leader, a great intellectual, a good friend of our ACC director, Father Matthew. Professor KCR Raja is one of the best masterminds in the area of management. He has been a management director, a coach, and counselor after having worked in multinational company for 20 years. Professor Raja has spent over 35 years in the management education and education management. He was the founder director of the Bombay University's Garware Institute of Career Education and Development, and he has pioneered in the development of educational, vocational higher education in India. At the invitation of the Association of Community Colleges, he visited community colleges in the United States and made a profound presentations on vocational higher education in India at the annual conference of the association in Washington. Professor Raja was later the director of the SP Jain Institute of Management Studies, rated today among the 10 best management institutes in India. He was the founder director of Gidek Rofel Institute of Management, WAPI, in 1999. Professor Raja was one of the board, boards of the institutions he founded as well as of the University of Mumbai's Jamna Lal Bajaj Institute of Management Studies and the Institute of Distant Education till he left Mumbai in 2012. In fact, Professor Raja helped to establish Jasni Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Nasri Munji Institute of Management, Mumbai. Professor Raja helped Rotary Club of Mumbai best start a chair in management of non-profit organizations at the Nasri Monji Institute of Management Studies in Mumbai. Professor Raja has designed several management simulation exercises, both general and purpose and company specific. And he, his course material, particularly management games have helped success, successive batches of management practitioners fine-tune their decision-making skills. During the last 20 years, Professor Raja has been a mentor to several international organizations and individuals cutting across hierarchical levels. Professor Raja is currently independent and non-executive directors of Atasri Foundation, a non-profit organization. Thank you very much, Professor Raja, sir, for joining with us. Over to you to moderate this amazing webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Shravan Sukumar. And uh, thank you, Father Matthew, for giving me this opportunity once again to come before you and moderate this discussion. And I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to uh, meet someone and uh, to be part of the discussion at which His Grace Archbishop Felix Machado is going to be our speaker. I had heard him once uh, on YouTube, and I have been wanting to hear him live ever since. And that opportunity has presented itself to me today. And the subject of his talk is no less enchanting, Raymond Panikya. Raymond Panikya. The name itself suggests the meeting of two religions. He was an apostle of interfaith dialogue and uh, the depth of scholarship that he represented in both Hinduism and Christianity is something which is not only amazing and exemplary, but something which inspires all of us to seek better understanding of both these religions and to develop mutual appreciation of the beliefs and values. And to talk about him, we have His Grace Archbishop Felix Machado of Versailles, himself a proponent of interreligious dialogue, whose talks on promoting interfaith harmony have attracted both Hindus and Christians alike uh, to his way of presenting to his beliefs, to his uh, uh, expressions of faith. I would not go further. 
I would, before we go further, I'd request uh, Reverend Sukuma to formally introduce him. But let me just add that um, while the talk is on, uh, all the participants, all of us, are free to use the chat box to write out our questions. We would save time if the questions are written out so that they can be taken up at the end of the discussion, one by one. So over to Reverend Sukuma. Thank you very much, sir. Let me have the great pleasure to introduce the speaker for this webinar. He's a visionary, a great leader with humility, a most hardworking and compassionate leader with a dedication. One of the finest scholars who has been influencing thousands of people by his academic knowledge and his profound leadership, none other than by today's presenter, Archbishop Dr. Felix Machado, who is the champion in the area of inter-religious dialogue. Archbishop Dr. Felix Machado had completed schooling in Vasai. He successfully completed his studies in Indian and Western philosophy from St. Pius X College, Archdiocesan Major Seminary, Goregon, Mumbai. Licentiate in Christian Theology from Catholic Faculty of Theology, Lyon in France. Diploma in Third World Theologies from Mary Knoll School of Theology, New York in United States of America. Master of Arts in Christian Theology from Mary Knoll School of Theology in New York. Doctor of Philosophy from one of the prestigious schools by name Fordham University in United States. He was a staff, faculty staff at Hofstra University, Hampshire, Long Island in USA. He taught Indian philosophy and systematic dogmatic theology in San Pius X College. He was under secretary at the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, Pope's office at Vatican City. Archbishop Dr. Machado has participated and continues to participate in the international seminars and conferences in different countries of the world and delivered profound keynote addresses, major talks, conferences, etc. He was appointed as a Bishop of the Diocese of Nasik with the personal title of Archbishop on 16th January 2008 by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI and ordained Bishop on 8th March 2008 in Nasik, India. Presently, he's the Archbishop, Bishop of Diocese of Wasai since 19th December 2009. He has been chairperson for Office of Ecumenical and Interreligious Dialogue of a Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences for two consecutive terms. He has been chairperson for Office of Interreligious Dialogue and the Desk for Ecumenism of the Catholic Bishops Conference of India and chairperson for Commission of Ecumenism of Conference of Catholic Bishops of India. He was a president of the Western Regions Bishops Council for two consecutive terms. He is the Secretary General of Catholic Bishops Conference of India from February 2020. He is a member to Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue appointed by Pope Francis on 8th July 2020. Dear Your Grace Archbishop, we're extremely delighted to have you. We're fortunate to have you with us. We're eager to listen to your knowledge and wisdom. Friends, let us all welcome Archbishop Dr. Felix Machado, who is a champion in the area of interreligious dialogue, to take over this webinar on the life of Raimondo Panico on the central theme series on sages and saints of India. Your Grace, the screen is yours now. Thank you very much, Reverend Sukumar, for these kind words of yours as introduction. I, before I may forget in the, uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the course of this seminar, I want to thank at the outset, uh, Father Matthew, congratulate him also uh, for organizing this series of Hindu Christian uh, uh, sages on, and saints of India. Uh, CBCI as secretary general for myself, I consider I am also in a way uh, responsible for being sponsor of this kind of uh, uh, initiative that has been taken. Bishops are extremely 
happy about this initiative, Father Matthew. And I want to also uh, thank uh, Professor Raja. You know, I'm so delighted to have such eminent personalities here present among uh, uh, the thank audience you. here. And uh, therefore, uh, please, uh, Father Matthew, thank all the ECC team, which uh, is so dear to me. All of them are dear to me, as you know my history. You know, I could have landed there and perhaps died there also, I don't know, but uh, God had other plans. I'll, I'll now uh, straight away get into the topic uh, on Raymond Panikar, who uh, has been my uh, PhD guide in the United States of America uh, when I was studying uh, and not only just guide, but he became a close friend of mine and philosopher also of mine. And uh, he has, in a certain sense, influenced me. And I am uh, ever grateful to God for that. You know, at an early age, I decided to become a priest, Catholic priest, and uh, joined the seminary. And that was 1966. So just a few years, one year, I would say, after the uh, conclusion of the Second Vatican Council for us Catholics. And uh, in 1966, when I joined, uh, I had deep interest in philosophy, uh, Indian philosophy, but then as Catholic uh, priest also must know good bit of Western philosophy. And so I took keen interest in Indological and Indic kind of studies, you know, uh, brought up in Marathi atmosphere, uh, very close to Mumbai, like the suburbs of Mumbai. And uh, we were steeped uh, completely, even though Catholic, in Marathi culture, in Marathi language, you know, but uh, in uh, pan-Indian kind of philosophy. And so that is where I first heard of Raymond Panikar. Uh, his name was unknown to me, but he impressed me immensely for his groundbreaking book. And I want to mention that at the beginning, the title of the book is The Unknown Christ of Hinduism. It's a very catchy title. And at that time in the seminary, but I also saw that uh, it was a hot kind of uh, uh, topic of the book. You know, the Second Vatican Council opening up and uh, somebody coming with uh, such a drastic kind of proposal of uh, a book like The Unknown Christ of Hinduism. I would just like to introduce to you who is Raymond Panikar. Raymond was born in Barcelona, uh, Spain, uh, Barcelona in 1918, 1918. Son of a Hindu father and a Catholic, Catholic Catalonian uh, Catholic mother. Uh, he grew up in a traditional Catholic Christian family in Barcelona. As an adult, Raymond decided also to become a Catholic priest and so pursued his formation and became a priest. He obtained a doctorate in science, in chemistry, and later completed two other doctorates, one in philosophy, one in theology. Uh, gifted with sharp acumen, ability and readiness to learn, he, till he died, I was in touch with him. He was open mind. He never said, I have finished, you know, as it were, I have done my uh, monumental work. But he always wanted to learn even from the simplest of the simple people. And so uh, he also had uh, mastered various languages, ancient and modern languages. In fact, whenever I heard him give talk, uh, by the time I was becoming his friend, and he, especially, especially when it came to quoting the books or uh, answering the questions, he would talk to the person in that person's mother tongue, you know, and that was quite possible for the man. Uh, all this, as well as his hard work, brought Raymond Panikar in the world of great thinkers. His books, over 20 volumes, and when I say volumes, 
they are monumental size volumes, sometimes even reaching to thousand pages. And these books have been published with several editions by different publishers throughout the world. For example, this uh, Unknown Christ of Hinduism has been published by different uh, publishers uh, with different editions, maybe, I don't know, 15, you know, throughout the world, and it still continues to be published. And each time, Raimon would try to kind of modify from the uh, knowledge that he would get without, of course, changing the main topic of the book. Uh, his scholarly articles published in world-renowned journals on philosophical, theological, social, cultural, religious, scientific, historical, and linguistic topics uh, from 67 to 71, he was visiting professor of comparative religions at the Center for Study of World Religions, Harvard University. Then since 71, he was professor of comparative philosophy and history of religions in the Department of Religious Studies, University of California at Santa Barbara. He also taught and lectured many in many universities in Europe, in Asia, particularly in Banaras Hindu University and North and South America also. Now, everywhere he wanted them, uh, they wanted him to stay and teach, but he did not continue teaching. He, when he was in most demand, he would leave that place like Harvard also. Now, it is difficult to introduce this man. He himself would often say, who, who am I? He says, I was born at crossroads a Christian who discovered that I was Hindu. Later, I got converted to Buddhism without ever having le left my Christian faith. This is how he introduced himself many times. Panikar elaborates his personal journey in the book I mentioned, The Unknown Christ of Hinduism. This is what he says, and I quote, because of a personal problem of conscience, Personal here is not indicating myself as a particular individual, but my relationship with the world, he says, I was looking for the most positive way to overcome a tradition, as I described my journey above, and the solution was not to step out of it as if it were a bullock cart or to cancel one's membership as if it were a club but to live that tradition, that is to pass it on, to continue it, to climb to the top where other peaks are visible or to descend to the depths where the throbbing of the world is perceptible. I feel that I owe it to many to explain the continuity of my path in spite of the mutation that has taken place both in me and in our world. I can only be free from a certain type of Christianity or Hinduism, and for that matter, from Buddhism and secularism, if I become a better Christian and a better Hindu. So therefore, the book is not uh, unknown Christ of Hinduism, he says, the book is not a mere secretion of the brain. It is part of what I was, and what I was cannot be blotted out. It is useless to repudiate it. This is how the man tries to talk about himself. Let, just let us go a little bit deeper into the book, Unknown Christ of Hinduism. First of all, you know, the title was very misleading to many like me. When I heard of this book for the first time as a philosophy student, I thought he meant to say, that there is unknown Christ in Hinduism, which the Hindus do not know, but it is quite opposite. What he meant was the unknown Christ of Hinduism is unknown to Christians, and they must try to know that Christ, you know, before they go and preach to them. You know, he, he, never, he never said anything against preaching and against evangelization, against the mission, but he's trying to kind of, you know, come to terms with what, how we should do it. And so the, uh, uh, his contribution in this book, 
is a more critical Christian self-understanding at a very crucial time. The book invites the reader to a contemplative insight into that mystery that can only be named in the vocative and whose name is a super name chiseled upon a white pebble that can be properly kept only in the cave of art. Manikar further explains, if Hinduism claims to be the religion of truth, Christianity claims to be the truth of religion. Hinduism is ready to absorb any authentic religious truth. Christianity is ready to embrace any authentic religious value. So therefore, the book is addressed to Christians who must encounter Hinduism in order to know Christ. The genuinely Christian attitude to call forth that truth of Hinduism without destroying the Hinduism's identity. You know, how cautiously he puts his language, you know, that while trying to kind of, you know, uh, learn Hinduism as Christians, you don't try to destroy Hinduism, but try to learn something from it. To Christianity, Hinduism in turn offers the authentically Hindu gift of a new experience of an interpretation, a new dimension, in fact, of the mystery. Now, Panikar gives two quotes on the very first uh, page of the book, one from Katha Upanishad, uh, and the other one uh, is from the Gospel according to John. See, the, uh, when he talks about the Gospel, this is what he picks up from John 1.26, Gospel according to John. When uh, uh, John the Baptist says, in between you stands whom you do not know. John the Baptist says about Jesus, in between you stand, you stands one whom you not you do not know. The kingdom of God is neither among nor within, but between you. This is how Madhya, uh, you know, the word Madhya in Sanskrit, in between, the middle, the in the midst, in the center, the mediator, the Madhyamaka, the middlemost. The genuinely Christian attitude is to call forth that truth of Hinduism without destroying the latter's identity to Christianity. Hinduism uh, must uh, uh, really offer that mystery, uh, Jesus Christ as the mystery. The Catholicity of Hinduism calls forth the true Catholicity of Christianity, says Panikar, while the truth of Christianity calls forth the truth of Hinduism. The passage from a narrow Catholicity and an exclusive truth to a full Catholicity and to recognition of the fact that truth can be neither limited nor monopolized is the paschal adventure of every religion, according to Panikar. A growing Christianity is also a Christianity moving towards greater fullness. You know, this is the mystery of the cross, according to Panikar. Now, I enter into the thought of Panikar. You know, Panikar from the beginning insists on leaving our assumptions and presumptions when we engage in dialogue. According to Panikar, the mistake many of us make is that we enter into dialogue, but then we still are not unarmed of our assumptions and of our presumptions. So when asked to speak, for example, on prayer, peace, and unconditional love, Panikar would begin, begin by questioning competi competitivity, achievement, success, and the like in modern societies. He's very critical, but not kind of you know, critical in the sense of, uh, I don't like it and I hate it, you know, not that kind of. He's honestly critical because he's interested. And so he's critical of modern kind of uh, society. Uh, and therefore, Panikar sees three uh, things. Uh, the rationality has to be questioned in today's world. 
the way we kind of reason things out, rationality, dialect, dialectical thinking. He wants dialogical thinking and not dialectical thinking. And he wants ontologization of the juridical order. I will explain a little bit of these three things that Panikar is asking for. Uh, they are interrelated as most religious traditions acknowledge. First about rationality. You know, Panikar goes deeper in arguing man, meaning human being, has been defined as a rational animal deforming the Aristotelian assertion that man is that living being in which the logos transits and equating the logos with the reason. Symbolically speaking, rationality amounts to the primacy of the head over the heart. See how Panikar talks. In our thinking, we often think that uh, head is above the heart. I think if we realize there is a flaw here, you know, indeed, it is easier to have a clear head than a pure heart, forgetting that they belong together. Pure rationality asks for a purpose before doing any action. See, this is the little Western modern kind of thinking. A reason for any step we take. We ask for a reason for any step we want to take. It is not reasonable to begin an action without a purpose, we say. A final cause. It is said that the good intention vouches for the morality of an action and thus becomes justified. See how consequences are there when we take uh, thinking about kind of feeling or heart, you know. It appears as if the truth itself has become the prisoner of human reason. The principle of sufficient reason has been in, enthroned as the essential feature of a truly human behavior. So, Panikar is not questioning, by the way, the primacy of reason, because he says Thomas Aquinas is misunderstood. Uh, Aquinas does not want to prove the existence of God, but Aquinas only wanted to show that the belief in God is reasonable belief. That is what he really wanted. But we thought that rationality is everything. And, you know, the feeling level or the heart level is nothing. And so uh, I want to go to dialectical thinking that Panikar suggests against dialectical thinking. Panikar questions the West, Western obsession with analytical thinking, which he says is the direct corollary of rationality. He sees the flaw in thinking that knowledge of the parts explains the whole. So Panikar asks, can we identify thinking and being? And he affirms that rational thinking discloses to us what is true and therefore we conclude it to be the real, which is an unwarranted step further. So dialectical, dialectical thinking is foremost a conceptual thinking and the concept, according to Panikar, is the result of an operation of the mind abstracting from singular, singular, singular entities. So the reasoning on the abstract level has three essential factors. Even an absolute religion, uh, even an absolute reason cannot pretend that it knows everything without postulating that everything is rational. Secondly, Reality is not bound to obey any analytical thinking. It means that reason is not the supreme judge. We may not understand, we may not comprehend uh, the irrational, but we may be aware of many real situations that are not rational. For example, love may be rationally inexplicable, but love is not necessarily rational. Human covers a wider field than rationality. And third, we cannot love on command, nor truly pray as rational decision of the will. We may be convinced that we need to pray and even be forced ourselves to pray, 
but this may not be only a useful preparation for a life this but this may be only a useful preparation for a life of prayer prayer is a free and spontaneous act of our spirit and the ethical universe does not need to follow the law of sufficient reason for this third the ontolo ontologization ontological we talk of that's that's what you mean panikar asks whether there are assumptions of westerners which need a truly cross cultural approach see westerners sometimes take it for granted that the whole world has to think this way or the whole world thinks this way they never stepped out of themselves you know to find out how other people can have other ways of thinking so that is what panikar is questioning you know he asks whether there are assumptions of westerners which need truly cross cultural approach to reality for becoming aware of the incongruity not so to say uh, not to say blasphemy that it sounds to eastern ears for instance to speak of god as a lawgiver who proclaims a set of rules which he himself cannot break because god himself cannot break the rules god gives Uh, so the argument goes they belong to the very nature of things giving thus to this nature a state equal to god and identifying our concept of nature with divinity so one must note carefully that for panikar geographical east and west are relative to one's position depends where one stands i am talking to you at the moment am i eastern am i western you know it has to be questioned the typically western spirit can be found all over the globe just as traditionally eastern ways of looking at things are gaining ground in the so called western world also if there is to be a real cross fertilization between cultures panikar asks we need to discover both the horizons east and west in oneself not go out to west to find out west or come to east to find out east but one person in today's society uh, must have these two horizons both horizons and panikar calls for a true collaboration among all for when we find the other within the self and the self within the other and when the heroic ego of one's ego gives way to the full realization of the self what indians would call atman or whatever you wish to call the whole that uh, we ourselves are bringing this microcosm to wholeness we contribute to the integrity of the whole thus in each of us there is a kind of east and west although one aspect unusually predominates raymond panikar happens to be the first catalan first catalan you know coming from uh, catalonia the barcelona part of uh, spain he is the first spaniard he is the first indian and with the with one recent exception from the middle east the first asian to deliver the prestigious gifford lectures in edinburgh in 1989 there were centennial lectures and very prestigious series of lectures that raymond panikar was invited to give and he gave them under the title trinity and atheism the dwelling of the divine in the com- contemporary world these lectures are now published in 2010 entitled the rhythm of being they are published by orvis books new york 2010 and uh, uh, i would uh, say that uh, you know one should not miss reading these gifford lectures because they have been They are, they are not transcripts of lectures given just scribe but they are they took time from 89 he did not want to publish until 2010 and often i visited panikar in tavertet near barcelona in spain and i lived with him and he had all the manuscripts constantly revising constantly revising in the light of new things that he would uh, learn others now 
there is another ground breaking thought of panikar it's a ground breaking thought and i think it is attributed to panikar as unique uh, his thought of intra religious dialogue see we often talk of intra religious dialogue but panikar came out with a intra religious dialogue so his contribution to the comparative study of religion uh, and philosophy can scarcely even be summarized he sought to bridge the gap between traditional ways of knowing science scientia and those of modern science because he had three doctorates he sought to extend from an in-house discussion among christians to a genuine dialogue between religions a dialogue a dialogical dialogue rather than a dialectical one which implies the discovery of the other as being who speaks and acts in his own or in her own name that is an other who is an original source of intellection this calls this also implies an awareness of our own individual limitations and hence a certain relativization of our personal opinions for panikar dialogue cannot be constrained by rules of the game laid down it to the other if you want to dialogue let us play the games acceptable for both the partners no single religious or cultural tradition exhausts the millennial millennial human experience says panikar panikar categorically states that nobody has a monopoly on human being nobody has a monopoly on human being panikar's famous book the intra religious dialogue which was published by paulus press in new york in 78 has been ground breaking in the field of inter religious dialogue in it panikar explains elaborately that when one studies the doctrines of the various religions it is called inter religious dialogue but more rarely the dialogue catches hold within the very within the very human person and removes his or her mask of being a religious spokesperson within his own tradition and that is the intra religious dialogue meaning like the struggle that one goes in oneself within and that panikar values very much because we put masks to appear in front of others and we patch uh, patch up things we kind of defend we kind of hide you know we are not honest with ourselves and that's where panikar says you must do that and so uh, one then seeks the meaning of life in the light of the experiences that have crystallized within the various traditions and which are already more or less assimilated by the concrete person one is dealing with this intra religious dialogue often times leaves the individual in a solitude which can be purifying or destructive so he warns us about the dangers there are of this kind of intra religious dialogue uh, i can only think of one example uh, of a catholic monk uh, his name was uh, uh lasso you know benedictine uh, monk uh, cistercian sorry cistercian monk a uh, french person who came to tamil nadu and his name was uh, lasso he took the name of avikshitananda a french monk and he threw himself completely he even took his spiritual guide as ramana marshi he did not take a a catholic as uh, as his uh, spiritual father he took ramana marshi as his spiritual father he never left his monkhood he was cistercian catholic monk to the bones and flesh and this man almost risked his life you know that is what panikar is asking for so there is purification but there is also destruction uh Uh, the risk of purification and risk of destruction in brief the true meaning between religions is itself religious it takes place in the heart of the human person in search for his own way it is then that the dialogue is intra religious 
it becomes moreover a religious act in itself, a quest for salvific truth. One participates in such a dialogue not only by looking above towards the transcendent reality, towards the original tradition, but also horizontally towards the world of other humans who themselves have also found paths leading to the realization of human destiny. So intra-religious dialogue hardly makes a sound. See, one who practices this, like Abhikshitananda, he was lost in India. How many Indians know about him? He died in India. He was even buried in uh, uh, Pune. You know, he died in, uh, I think, uh, Bangalore, if I'm not mistaken. Then he was brought, brought his bones were brought to uh, Pune. And then his family, one of his nieces, came and exhumed the bones and took them to France. You know, but he lived a very uh, kind of uh, a, a hidden kind of life, you know. That's what Panikar says, that intra-religious dialogue does not make sound. It goes on within the depths of the person. It is open and deep dialogue with oneself, which is no longer locked in the jail of egotism. It is deep because one does not dialogue ex exclusively with one's own tradition or with one's, with others as others, but with a self which has assimilated in its own way a view of reality which has drawn upon different sources. When one, when the contact with others is superficial, it is easy to show tolerance and even sympathy towards others, but one does not ask oneself the personal question of truth. Too often a respective attitude hides a contemptuous indifference. Very blunt and very direct, you know, Panikar. Intra-religious dialogue is an inter internal dialogue in which one struggles with the angel, the diamond, and oneself. One asks if one can have access to the whole of religious truth since the neighbors seem to have other convictions that are as radical as one's own. But this internal dialogue is neither a monologue nor a simple soliloquy with God, nor is it simply a meditation on the partner's belief or on another's religion. In this dialogue, man or woman is in search of his or her own salvation, salvation, but he or she accepts to be taught by the other and not <clears throat> only by his own clan. Intra-religious dialogue is of its very nature an act of assimilation, like food. Food is assimilated. Food is not just thrown like calories into body. Food becomes the body. Food is assimilated. That is the... Uh, uh, and Panikar, being a Catholic priest, says it is Eucharistic experience, alluding to the central sacrament of Catholicism. It tries, it tries to assimilate the transcendental, uh, transcendent into our immanence. Panikar here anticipates some probable questions. Isn't there the beginning of a religious apostasy in intra-religious dialogue? He asks honestly that question. Shouldn't I first try to better understand the riches of my tradition before venturing into the unknown ways? Doesn't intra-religious dialogue smack of a tendency towards eclecticism and syncretism, which betrays my lack of faithfulness and my shallowness? So these are quite honest questions that Panikar asked. And he answers that intra-religious dialogue in its most authentic aspect is not to, be not to be found as purely sociological or historical level. It is, in a word, a constitutive element of man, woman, who is a nexus of relationships, a person and not an isolated individual, nor an unconscious atom, nor a number within a democratic complex. It is our human constitution which beckons to discover within ourselves the human uh, universe and also all of reality. 
when we speak of man woman as microcosm this does not mean that he or she then con is considered as an other world in miniature side by side with multiplicity of small worlds but it means that he is the miniaturization of the only world that he or she is the world of human scale so interreligious dialogue by helping us discover the other in ourselves you know it is like the discovery of the other in ourselves love your neighbor as yourself jesus said to the personal realization and mutual fecundation between the tradition of mankind that can no longer live in a state of isolation separated from each other by walls of mutual mistrust or in a state of war which is more or less camouflaged by emulation and competition even peaceful coexistence is often but one form of political strategy in order to maintain the status quo preferable undoubtedly to war so panikar professing his christian faith writes when i shall have discovered the atheist the hindu and the christian in me when i shall consider my brother as one another myself and when the other will not feel alienated in me then we shall be closer to the kingdom of god i have just tried to summarize you know in short the the deep thought of panikar now panikar asks therefore another question what do what do we need he says we need to return to primordial meaning of myth myth if faith is to make any sense to our life he wrote a big volume on myth faith and hermeneutics among panikar's innovative cross cultural studies one cannot ignore this volume myth faith and hermeneutics cross cultural studies published by paulis press in new york again in 79 1979 this book this book brings together the major essays which best illustrate his method of understanding the truth of more than one religious tradition from within from within panikar writes in his book if intellectual activity divorces itself from life it becomes not only barren and alienating but also harmful and perhaps eventually criminal myth is the fundamental area of human experience panikar says that myth is the fundamental area of human experience a living myth does not allow for interpretation because the living myth needs no intermediary myth is that which we have taken for granted that which we do not question and it is unquestioned because de facto it is not seen questionable the myth is transparent like light the myth purifies thought bypasses thought so that the unthought may emerge and the intermediary may disappear faith is understood as that dimension in man woman that corresponds to myth belief articulates the myth in which we believe without believing that we believe in it this is the way panikar used to talk hermeneutics is the art and science of interpretation of bringing forth significance of conveying meaning of restoring symbols to life and eventually of letting new symbols emerge hermeneutics implies going out from my own stand in order to understand another world view when reflecting on culture i will now have to start uh, concluding my uh, my presentation when in reflecting on culture and tradition panikar values the dimension of myth man cannot live without myths much is discussed about the insufficiencies of one's own cultures and religions and one realizes that none has the monopoly of kindness and truth even though reality is much complex and nuanced panikar offers five typological moments 
in order to uncover the emerging myth in the study of the history of encounter between the religious traditions of humankind. One must understand the five moments which have been mentioned uh, below, uh, which Panikars calls them chirological uh, than chronological in the uh, chronological sense. Uh, chirological for us Christians, we know kairos is the moment, whereas chronology are the events. Uh, and so uh, these five moments are this. There is a moment in everybody's life as isolation and ignorance. Each culture develops with the self-sufficiency of one's own group. Hardly any interest is shown outside of the unavoidable contacts with neighbors. Basically, the other does not exist. Second moment, chirological moment is indifference and contempt. The other is or others are considered at best nothing more than a problem or rivalry. Third moment, chirological moment in this uh, coming to awareness among ourselves, condemnation and conquest. From rivalry, one tends to consider the other someone to convert, even by honest means. The other almost becomes a threat, <clears throat> a threat we must do away with, a challenge to be taken up. Coexistence and communicate. Then fourth moment is coexistence and communication. Sooner or later, people realize that mutual tolerance, peaceful and sincere communication are the source of reciprocal and durable advantages. The other begins to intrigue us. There is a progressive uh, takeover by the other while remaining faithful to one's own culture. Care is taken not to alienate the other while having the other integrated within. And finally, fifth moment, convergence and dialogue. True dialogue requires not only a welcoming and listening disposition, but also a capacity to understand or even the possibility to do, possibility to do so. The other starts to become another pole of ourselves. Confrontation tends towards complementarity. New ways of life appear, not without causing often victims on both sides, uh, on the side of the identity and the alterity. Our, in our times, these five moments which have been mentioned above seem to be recognized, but we have not yet moved beyond them. So Panikar adds five other words to situate the present encounter between religious traditions. And this, uh, uh, these five, I, uh, I do not know whether I stop uh, you know, after giving these five or just take a couple of minutes more to conclude. First is inevitable. General feelings of all that peoples and world religions can no longer live in isolation and mutual indifference. We all agree with this. Second, import, uh, the important, uh, important uh, religions are the soul of every culture, and because of this, they play an essential role in the world in this world of ours, which is becoming more and more one. Third, it is urgent. For better or worse, today's world is in effervescence, and even more, it is in a boiling point. If mankind's venerable traditions do not contribute in forging a new mentality, the latter will be formed without their immediate impact. There is no way we can avoid the urgency of the situation. We are experiencing this ourselves as Christians. You know, uh, upsetting, uh, fourth upsetting, meeting of religions troubles one's peace of mind, definitely. Dialogue is not the easiest thing. You called me in the beginning, you introduced me as, you know, champion of dialogue and all that. But I told the bishops also, it is not the easiest ministry of my episcopacy as my as bishop. Not the easiest ministry. It is a cross for me. But that is the challenge. Cross is a challenge and I will not leave my cross. And so meeting of religions troubles one's peace of mind, disrupts the most deeply rooted beliefs, creates confusion which can, be, which can lead to internal and external breakups. It questions that which up till 
up until then remained undisputed for me, even indisputable. Oftentimes, negative criticism gains ascendancy over positive criticism because it is almost impossible to build before having cleared the field. Purifying. Uh, none of us is self-sufficient. Nobody can lay claim to universality when the very way of expressing it is sectarian. This coming to awareness has a purifying effect. Other systems and other beliefs, other habits and ways of life can not only be only compare with our own, but also purify, complement, correct, enhance, and even change what till then we, we were considered definitive and hence untouchable acquisitions of uh, mankind. Just a couple of minutes, if you wish. I think I began uh, at, at 6.10 and uh, I have five minutes. Uh, is that Father Matthew or should I? Yes, 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 oh. yes, your grace. So, so I will go to the uh, conclusion. Uh, you know, uh, my um, conclusion of Panikar would be, Panikar continued and deepened the Hindu-Christian dialogue, bringing it to a genuine dialogue between religions by publishing another book of more, almost 1,000 pages called The Vedic Experience, Mantra Manjari, an anthology of the Vedas for modern man and contemporary celebration. It's an interesting book how a Catholic Christian priest, a good theologian, totally open, kind of ventures into this uh, book. And although everything is the Vedic tradition, but one can see the way it is presented is very Catholic, very Christian, I would say. More than Catholic, very Christian for all of us. And so uh, there is another book Panikar had written, uh, has written, uh, which is cross-cultural Christology, uh, Christophany. He calls the book Christophany, the fullness of man, capital M, you know, meaning the... the uh, Manusha and not just uh, the masculine. You know. Raimund Panikar's writings have been published extensively in various languages and spread far and wide throughout the world. I do not intend to give an exhaustive study, uh, exhaustive list of all his writings in such short paper. I would mention one among them because it has had deep impact on my own way of being, thinking and acting in this world as I mentioned, the monumental achievement of Panikar, the Vedic experience. Uh, for me as a Christian in India, this volume has become my close companion after the Bible. For me, Bible is my first love. And after the Bible, I would go to this Vedic experience. Panikar himself declares in his foreword, in his opera Omnia, there is a, a project now almost completing, Orvis is publishing, uh, all volumes as opera omnia of the, uh, and in that uh, Panikar first book of this first volume, Panikar writes uh, that my writings are not the fruit of mere speculation, but rather they are, autobi are autobiographical. That is, my writings were first inspired by a life and praxis that have been only subsequently molded into writings. So Panikar reveals that he did not live for the sake of writing, but he wrote to live in a more conscious way so as to help his fellows with thoughts that only from his own mind, but also springing from a superior uh, not only from his own mind, but also springing from a superior source with capital S, which may perhaps be called the spirit. Although he does not claim that his writings are in any way inspired. Finally, I just want to tell you that uh, Panikar wrote a long preface to my own book, uh, which I wrote on uh, a Hindu mystic of my place. Uh, a very revered mystic in the of the 12th century. Uh, the preface is a chapter in itself. It is 14 uh, big pages on mysticism, a theme which is very dear to Panikar, mysticism. Let me conclude this brief sketch 
uh, by quoting uh, what Panikar wrote in the pre preface of my book, mysticism should not be seen as the special province of the few, but rather as one essential dimension of humankind. Although present in a somewhat withered form in today's technological and scientific culture, which approaches human reality through rigorously bifocal lenses, in spite of uh, protests of artists and the passive resistance of ordinary people. Mysticism means integral experience of life. It is the holistic experience of reality. Every person has a mystic hidden in him or her. Thank you very much for your patience and uh, for your uh, listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Your Grace. In a matter of uh, about an hour, you have taken us through a tremendous amount of material which was not merely to me, but I guess to most of the people here, not known at all about Panike. And to have heard it from a person who had who was so close to Raymond Panike and who has spent so much time and knew his mind so well was indeed a very, very great matter of fortune for all of us. Uh, each statement of Raymond Panikya that you had quoted itself is so profound that uh, they, that it's in itself merits a wide discussion. Like the very first statement that you quoted, uh, I left Europe as a Christian. I discovered I was a Hindu and returned as a Buddhist without ever having ceased to be a Christian. So one would look forward to someone saying, I left India as a Hindu. I discovered I was a Christian and came back without ever having ceased to be a Hindu. Or the same kind of dialogue going on among uh, persons of different faiths. Similarly, your interpretation of uh, intra-religious faith was a revolution as a the constant dialogue going on within oneself more than anything else. That itself is something which is worth so much to think about. Then again, the five chirological moments and uh, the way that you beautifully summed it up. I would not go further. I would I only just uh, touched upon a few things that was of very, very special interest to me. But I'm sure there'll be questions. There are a few questions, and we could probably take them up. One question. My question is, how do we explain this intra-religious dialogue to others who question our loyalty to our own faith? Uh, do you want me to listen to first a few questions and then answer? Or? Okay, right, right. I'll answer his question. Right. The next question is, yeah. Your Grace, can you elaborate Eucharistic experience in transcendental concept with inter and intra-religious with the view of Raman Panika? And the third question is, every week our lectures become, oh, that's just a comment. Uh, become more and more interesting. There is one more. Raman Panikya seems to be an epitome of interreligious dialogue. He internalized this dialogue. Living in India, we are continuously influenced by other religions. And I always wondered about it. Now I have a word for it. Intra-religious dialogue. That's also a, a feedback. And the fourth one, Your Grace, thank you very much for that illuminating lecture and introducing Mr. Panikya. My question, is there a close connection between the Gospel of St. John and the Bhagavad Gita? These are the questions that we have and time permitting, we could take on more. Yes, yes. So I'll, I'll just try to... Uh... 
more than answering these are my comments and maybe there are other answers from others to these questions for example the first question about intra religious dialogue how do we explain it to others you know i think uh, panikar's idea was not so much you know to be able to explain i think <clears throat> if we live something ourselves that becomes the greatest uh, and the most uh, the strongest i would say uh, uh, evidence of uh, what we live you know we when we try to go to explain people will come up uh, with some blocked kind of difficulties you know they have blockages as it were and then they or they have assumptions and presumptions and then they kind of uh, see it from that uh, uh, that kind of uh, color you know everything and so therefore intra religious dialogue is a challenge that you know panikar wanted that if we talk of dialogue let us take it serious because we talk of dialogue and sometimes we we know there is a criticism you know oh so you are following one method to uh, bring your religion to us and now you are using this another method called dialogue you know i mean you know i think if we are honest in dialogue much is to be gained we are afraid you know that uh, we will lose this and we will lose that but if we are like for me not for a second i doubt my faith to tell you the truth but i feel freely to kind of you know visit uh, other people and my deep respect for everyone you know is is un uh, un uh, i would say shakeable unshakeable because my faith in jesus christ is is very strong i feel you know i i cannot imagine i would ever give it up i cannot imagine that however my openness you know to this intra religious dialogue is my way of being you know and so i respect you know the 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 key thing in dialogue is not so much to become the other of course that that's as a method to become the other in order to fully understand the other you know when i taught my classes to the seminarians in uh, bombay major seminary uh, i became if i taught hinduism i became hindu at least for the sake of pedagogy you know but not just that they came to know that i love hinduism if i taught them islam they know that i love islam not islam in its, itself but i love muslims i love hindus i love buddhists you know this love for the other I, you know i heard a uh, 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 an evangelist the other day uh, perhaps uh, some of us christians here have heard uh, what is his name now i forget anyway american evangelist and he's a good man i mean i i listen to these people out of my openness you know because i am also a ecumenical person i i don't like to close myself indoors and so therefore the, he was talking about the parable of good samaritan and he says this is a parable the most misunderstood parable because he says the real point of jesus is who can become you know love your neighbor as yourself who can love another person as oneself he says to what extent can we go to love that can i love the other as myself is that possible he is asking that question you know i think here it, it, that same uh, commandment that jesus summarizes in one commandment love god and love your neighbor as yourself is what is asked for intra religious dialogue you know that is the challenge for us do i really love my hindu uh, neighbor my hindu friend do i really love my muslim friend this love is at the bottom you know dialogue is not discussion of theories and doctrines it for, it, is, it is relationships it is relating to the other and that's where i think intra religious dialogue comes in so it is not a question of kind of explaining a theory you know i think people notice that i love the hindus 
because I love the Hindus. You know, it is not, there is no uh, strings attached to it. That's my first question. Secondly, about the, the, the Eucharist, you know, explaining deeper that Eucharistic thing I said. You know, for me, the, when I receive the body of Christ, uh, every day I celebrate the uh, Holy Mass uh, and uh, I receive the body of Christ. When I receive the body of Christ, when I eat, you know, it is mandukare. Uh, it is that act of eating. Uh, in a way, I destroy the body of Christ. But that is what food is meant to be. Uh, we destroy food by eating it. The sumptuous food that is sometimes presented also in such a be uh, beautiful way. Not only it is tasty, but it is also presented in a, but we destroy that in order to eat. And the assimilation process that took, takes place, you know, we assimilate. That's what I was talking about the Eucharistic uh, uh, process that we become the body of Christ. Uh, the body of Christ makes me the body of Christ, part of the body of Christ. And that's why I, I mentioned that, you know, this, this word assimilation is a very special word for me because it is not merely throwing calories into my body, you know, in order to survive the next moment. As we say, some people live to eat, but some people eat to live. You know, I think this, this kind of difference is very uh, uh, important difference we, we should make, distinction we should make, because assimilation is not equal to kind of uh, filling, feed, uh, uh, filling ourselves with, with food. We don't fill ourselves with food. We eat food. And in Indian tradition, annam para brahmam, you know, the food is very much venerated. And I think that is what Eucharist for us is also. There are uh, fundamental differences here. I don't even immediately want to equate the two. But I'm saying that what I learn from my Indian uh, Hindu tradition is this, that they treat food with great respect. You know, that's why we are also in Christian tradition asked to say the blessing before meals, you know, because uh, now we, uh, St. Francis of Assisi would call it like my brother food or my sister food, you know. Uh, so that is, that is what I was trying to say. And... Uh, the Gospel and the, of John and Bhagavad Gita. Yes, there, there, is, there, there is a book written also about this by uh, Christians, you know. Uh, much study has been done, but more can be done. But it is true that uh, our Indian uh, Hindu uh, friends uh, of all the four Gospels love the Gospel of John the most because John tries to kind of go deeper into contemplation and contemplate the word, you know, and that's why the Hindus love the gospel according to John. And I think the Gita, when I studied Hinduism and the Bhagavad Gita, uh, uh, and uh, Professor Raja will remember in that uh, uh, my uh, talk in uh, uh, research institute. Uh, Observer. Today, Yes. Observers Research in, uh, 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 Foundation, I yes. tried to explain something about Bhagavad Gita when one Hindu began to uh, uh, kind of question me about uh, the stand of the Catholic Church that uh, uh, capital punishment cannot be kind of uh, acceptable, you know. We, we have no right to kill, take life of another person for whatever reason, you know. And so I was trying to explain to him the Bhagavad Gita. I was trying to, in fact, a uh, little bit contemplate on the, on the meaning of Bhagavad Gita from my Christian point of view, you know, uh, like Arjuna trying to say that how can I kill my uncles and my aunts and the, I mean, you know, all this. Uh, he asks that question to uh, Bhagwan Krishna and uh, uh, Bhagwan Krishna answers him. Do you think that you are the author of life? That if you don't kill your cousins, they will not die any, anyway. You know, sometimes we have that kind of noble intention, you know. But there are sometimes false intentions. That is how St. John 
for me it is uh, i love all the gospels i love all the gospels and i and i believe uh, firmly in all the gospels that is where my love for jesus i get but at the same time you know st john's gospel is contemplation on the word you know he goes into the depth of the matter the father and i are one it's a contemplation on the trinitarian mystery you know st john talks so much of the father he talks so much of the word and he talks so much himself and the third the spirit the holy spirit you know so that's why the uh, gospel of john and bhagavad gita i i agree the one who asked this question i agree that you know it's a, it's an interesting kind of a, a study for us thank you very much your grace uh, for a wonderful evening that we have had with you and for enlightening us and inspiring us to uh, look for more about raymond panicker and to be confirmed in our belief that as you had said that inter religious dialogue is inevitable that religion is the soul of culture that it is urgent in today's turbulent world it is maybe upsetting but it would certainly be purifying we uh, are indeed grateful to you and it reaffirms i'm sure it strikes a chord in every heart when we think of inter religious dialogue and even had a hindu christian dialogue as bringing out the fundamental unity of uh, all religions and in fact of humanity's common quest for a higher purpose for a higher state of spiritual being to reach a common destination whatever path we choose to reach that destination thank you very much indeed over to reverend sukuma thank you thank you milun can you speak about what is uh, for the next program yes father uh, the friends our next lecture will be on march june and the topic will be rabindranath thakur man of free mind and soul and the speaker will be bishop paul s salka thank you yeah uh, um, your grace um, it was a splendid profound and uh, erudite uh, lecture um, as uh, raymond panikar was your mentor he was capable of transmitting to us in a very short uh, period of time that means uh, around 50 minutes capable of giving us the gist of uh, what he has uh, contributed and only by someone who was close to him understood his thoughts will only be able to convey in such a clear way um i have uh, myself gone through many of his books and i have a, a copy of his mantra manjari and i love that it's a very fascinating as your grace has already said that a catholic priest capable of going deeper into the uh, intricacies of this vedic uh, expressions and the thoughts uh, thought patterns and very uh, elaborately and profoundly writing about that experiences so i must say that only you will be able to um, give us a gist of within this short span of time give uh, with the clarity uh, about raymond of panikar i have listened to many other people uh, giving lectures on raymond of panikar but i uh, found it so fascinating and so depth of uh, all his thoughts and i am grateful uh, to your grace for giving us such a, a short time period uh, the profound thoughts of um, raymond of panikar so a great intellectual as uh, your uh, your grace has explained a person who is deeply into chemistry and into philosophy and into theology so i am absolutely sure that he was using all those tools in order to uh, break into dialogue to go into the wider horizon of his uh, uh, belief systems thought patterns and to absorb from the other and i think that was what uh, given to us 
and since uh, Raymondo was your uh, uh, grace's mentor um, i am happy to see that your grace has also continuing that gate tradition and even to such a level that you know incorporating with the vatican uh, as under secretary and now the member of the interfaith dialogue council and uh, you are uh, guiding the the catholic bishops con conference of india for many uh, decades as uh, the chairman of the interfaith and the ecumenism dialogue now also the ccbi uh, chairman so those who are here we have uh, chemistry professors we have uh, also engineers we have mba experts and we have pastors and uh, chartered accountants and uh, we have from all the the wealth of uh, and the walk of life uh, they were uh, here and um, in the name of all of them i thank your grace for this wonderful and uh, splendid uh, lecture maybe we can uh, just clap or yeah and then thank you uh, very much yeah professor raja has done a very uh, meticulous job of uh, coordinating and also summarily presenting um, the the great uh, thoughts of uh, raymond panikar uh, expressed by our archbishop and also um, he was moderating the sessions in a wonderful uh, way and he himself uh, coming from the great tradition of uh, samudri family i am grateful that you know integrating this uh, wealth of uh, different religious traditions into your own life and as a mentor and uh, of and a guru of the uh, uh, management uh, expertise so in the name of all i also thank you professor thank you very uh, much. raja thank you. and um, yeah, i also thank my own uh, friends um, deputy director menlun and uh, reverend sukumar so who also coordinated and working behind maybe i am just showing my face but they are the people who are actively involved and then um, i am happy that you know we have people from france marte was uh, who is the uh, the niece of uh, francis acharya and then uh, somebody from uh, thessaloniki alexander uh, chertov was actually from russia and then from all over uh, uh, india and uh, some also uh, from abroad so thank you uh, very much and um, we have uh, father cherian who is also uh, secretary uh, of the office of the dialogue commission and then uh, caroline um, and her friends from the folklore movement and also perico who is a, an embodiment of uh, dialogue in bangalore and in karnataka and uh, so thank you everyone thank you so much and then uh, next thursday thank you we have on ravindranath tagore uh, but it is said that you know uh, ravindranath tagore's real name is ravindranath takur takur yeah so that is the yes. name but the british uh, changed it to tagore and uh, a bengali expert and um, also the language uh, Uh, scholar uh, from uh, bangladesh and he is uh, the retired primate of bangladesh that is the archbishop of uh, bangladesh of the uh, church of bangladesh so, so he will be uh, explaining about uh, ravindranath and his contributions and how he integrated his mystical vision so thank you very much until next uh, thursday thank you great